sound good guys and and at the end if you have something else you want to talk about that's fine with me so we're going to go through an introduction of Tehillim and it's just a brief introduction and then next Sunday God willing if Rabbi Ingrid's not here and there are no questions then I'll do uh, uh, the first psalm and uh, or, or, or more uh, we have to remember that the writing of the book of Psalms is probably the most well-known uh, religious text uh, in the world. Like all religions love the Psalms and read the Psalms. And we know that it was written by a man who was a great warrior, a uh, very dedicated man of God. David's life was a sacred life. Uh, yeah, he had issues at times but who doesn't have issues but he was consecrated to god and also to the people it wasn't so much his valor and courage that actually won the hearts of the people as it was his saintliness and his character his ability to touch the heart and mind of the people through his words and we, we find that later on, many of these psalms were used to chant in, in the temple. Uh, incredible thing to think that uh, the psalms that we read also have uh, a long history going back to, to uh, you know, 3,000 years or, or so, or somewhere around there. Um, psalms in general are praises to the Creator and they speak of the, the greatness and goodness of the God. God it declares the, the glory of God in the world, His power, His justice. And as someone said um, a few weeks ago, that David Amalek's psalms were, were at a level of declaration that it also included the nations. I think it's one of the it's the Psalms that give the nations permission to understand God in a very loving manner. All through the Psalms he mentions the nations. All through the Psalms he talks about how they'll come to Zion. Uh, we see this over and over. So to the B'nai Noach, Psalms is a rich text. I would say probably for us, more important than uh, a Siddur to read, because most of the prayers in the Siddur are what? Psalms, right? So it's very important. David pours out his heart in the Psalms and declares his sincerest pursuit and trust in Hashem. Many of the Psalms are, are actually prayers that he himself prayed, whether they were in privacy, in danger, hidden away in a cave, whatever it may be, David wrote these psalms that are prayers. The psalm reflects actually the full spectrum of life experiences, uh, both of the individual and the Jewish nation collectively. And we can see it all through the text as we'll go through the commentary. You'll say, see, like for example, in today's class, uh, I think it was Psalm 8 something, uh, we see that it's a reference to creation. It's a very beginning reference to creation, something that we didn't know because we've read it over and over and just didn't know it related. King David's story, his exile, persecution, struggles, and eventual triumph, uh, the Jewish people find their own story in the words of the Psalms, an example uh, and prophecy of his own life unfolds. Throughout the ages, Psalm, Psalms has therefore served as a boundless source of inspiration for us all. Now, what was David's motivation? Now, many, many people can say, uh, you know, they can assume different motivations. But for David, when you read the Psalms, it does something unique. It connects the heart and the mind. It connects the bridge between 
the mind and the heart. It bridges the gap between what is divine and that which is of physical illusions. We mentioned it this morning that Genesis is telling us about one part that is the aspect of the sublime and the, 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 the spiritual and then the addition to physicality, which is for us to help educate us what is in the spiritual. And the inner life of the human being is made up of the, the, the mind and the heart. In the inner life of, uh, of a Jew and also a, a pious non-Jew, is the, the mind is engaged in the study of Torah and the power of prayer, yet these cannot be separated uh, to separate worlds. One must infuse the other. Our physical world has to be infused with the spiritual world, and this is what David does. He takes these ideas that are lofty and beautiful, and he brings them down to such real human level. I used to laugh as a, as a young boy reading the Psalms about how God, he prays to God for him to bash the teeth of his enemies, right? It's like you think, now that's a man after my heart. That's a guy that thinks like I do. I mean, you really see his humanity come out. And one of the most beautiful things we've learned in Torah Judaism is that they don't try to mask over the, the what do you call it, the inadequacies of an individual. I mean, for example, I'm not sure that you or I would pray that prayer like ask God to bash the teeth of my enemies because like, whoo, don't want to say that. But David had some chutzpah when it came to God. But Moshe also had the same kind of chutzpah. Remember him saying, if you're going to wipe them off the, the book of life, then take my name off too. That's a pretty powerful message to spin to Hashem. That means that they were invested in the people themselves. Each prayer contains sections that are not prayers in the sense of beseeching, but are primarily informational, mind-oriented verses, for example, verses of praises, the blessings of the Shema. In these uh, two, there are interfusions. The meditation of the mind should result in feelings of the heart and feeling of love and awe for God. Similarly, Torah study cannot be cold exercise of the mind. This is one of the reasons why I said our approach to reading the Parsha and to study the Torah together is to make sure that we're not just getting comfortable with the, the intellectual pursuit of the historical context and to really look into what, what, is the, what is the key that's going to unlock another level of spirituality and understanding in our, in our pursuit of Hashem. The, it is important for us to understand that we should recite Psalms regularly. Uh, Dennis Humphrey gave me this book, Tehillim. And let's, can you read that okay? I don't know. This is a illustrated, the artist illustrated this book just for this. There's an artist that, that did all the pictures and artwork for it. But each one of them are highlighted with an introductory commentary and the psalm themselves. Beautiful, beautiful art, beautiful psalm and beautiful commentary. It's a great companion to put on the, on the, on the bed next to you. Um, it's important to be able to do that. The most selective of prophets, says the Midrash, was Moses. And the most selective of kings was David and Melech. However, Moses did However, whatever Moses did, David did. Moses delivered the Jewish people from the bondage of Egypt. David delivered them from the control of foreign powers. Moses waged battles against Sichon and Og, and David waged battles uh, of God uh, against the, uh, what do you call it, the idolaters of Canaan. Moses ruled over Israel and Judah. David ruled over Israel and Judah. Moses gave them five books of Moses, and David gave them five books of the Psalms. So what we're going to see is the Psalms are going to be broken down into five books, and each one of the Psalms are going to, are going to reflect aspects of Torah that you won't know unless you study the, uh, what do you call it, the commentaries. The commentaries are going to, in Psalms is going to reveal 
oh, well, David was talking about Jericho, or David was talking about the temple, or David was talking about this. It's incredible. Now, let's look at, remember Balaam? Balaam talked about Mashiach and King David, or the whole idea that it would come from the, the seed of David. And it says that in Balaam's prophecy, he speaks of two Mashiachs, first David and then the Mashiach who will usher in redemption. Mashiach, the, the uh, son of David, David is called the first Mashiach since David was set into motion all that his descendants will achieve. So this idea is that David is the precursor of the Mashiach and will give us an example of what the Mashiach will be like. When Maimonides describes Mashiach, he writes about a king who will arise from the house of David, who is immersed in the study of Torah. Like David, his forefather, Mashiach will study Torah in the same way David studied. The absolute selflessness. Not only will he perform the mitzvah selflessly, he will study the Torah selflessly as a matter of task. As of late, we've been disappointed, entertained, whatever your idea of, of the queen's death and all of the cabal that's been going on with their son, Harry, and you name it. And you think, wow, their pursuit is to go out and to do charity, to bring issues to the hurting, et cetera, et cetera. But none of them are dedicated to the study of Torah. Could you imagine what would happen to the UK and other nations if our leaders would dedicate themselves to the study of the Torah? What, what would eventually happen would be a whole transformation of the world. I wish it would happen in my lifetime, but maybe after Mashiach comes, we'll see that. The, it is said of David that he connects the heavenly Torah with the infinite one. The Torah is God's wisdom, which means that it is not God's essence. David, however, studied the Torah in a way that connected Torah with God's essence, as we'll explain in our studies. When we study the Torah, we connect to God, although we are always uh, inherently connected to God, once our souls are rooted in the essence of God, essence of God, this aspect of our souls lies dormant. So why is it so important for us to study and to understand that, the, like I mentioned today, the illumination that happened at creation when God said that he separated light from darkness and there had not been created any sun or stars? What was that? Well, that illumination was his wisdom. That illumination was the power of his memra, his word that was being spoken to bring about creation. That is the spiritual element that exists within our world. It's that divine, that divine spark that's in the world. And it seems that creation and light or illumination and spirituality seems to be separate things, but in reality in Judaism, they're, they're meshed together. They're, they're intertwined together. Uh, their, their, um, their calendars have to do with seasons and times and, and giving of harvest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all tied in with creation itself. It's an incredible idea to understand how powerful the Psalms are. Um, um, let's see... Um, I want to go through and show you what the five books of Psalms are. Does that sound interesting to you? Are you interested at all? Which ones are related to what book? The book of Psalms is, is divided into five parts corresponding with the five books of Moses. The first book corresponds to Genesis, the second to Exodus, and so on. Each of the four books ends with the word Amen. Each of the five books contains a central theme. Book 1, Psalm of Praise, composed by David and Melech, in which he praises God for the supernatural acts that he performed for David's benefit, concluding with Psalm 41, in which David tells of his miraculous recovery from illness. Book 2, Psalm of Prayer, composed both of sons of Korach uh, to sing in the temple, 
and for David himself. The book concludes with the verse of 7220, the prayers of David, son of Jesse, are concluded. Book three, Psalm of Thanksgiving for God's kindness. This book concludes with Psalm 89, which begins and will sing of God's kindness forever. Book four is the Psalm of Confession, some of Moses and others of, of by David. The book concludes with Psalm 106, in which David recounts the sins of the nation as well as individuals which were led into exile. The psalm includes hope and through repentance will come salvation. Last but not least, book five is the psalm that herald the ingathering of the exiles. Makes sense. And the liberation from foreign rule, the war of Gog and Magog, the salvation to be brought about by Mashiach, along with songs of thanksgiving, a new song, Psalm 149, and prayers for the masses that may inherit the redemption. Quoting, may their destiny become come to them swiftly. So the ten expressions of song. King David employs ten expressions of song throughout Psalms. It is Netzuch, uh, Nagun, Mitzmor, uh, Shir Halel, Tefila, and Barcha, and Hada'a, Esri, and Halulcha. These correspond to the ten elders who compose the psalm and the ten utterance with God create when God created the world. We talked about that for a bit. The ten decrees of holiness, the highest of which holy of holies, which corresponds to Halelucha. Uh, indeed, the most sublime of these expressions is hallelujah, since it includes God's name and praise uh, in one word. It's amazing. It goes on to talk about how important it is for in our daily practice to read the Psalms and to uh, understand them. And that's why a book like this, Tehillim, is an important book because within it is also the commentaries. Now you can get it online and you can look at it on Chabad, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let's look at some inspiration for reading or saying Tehillim. One who longs to cleave to God in his praises should cleave to the book of Tehillim, included our sages say that King David prayed with his psalms be recited in synagogues and study halls. For he had, for we have nothing greater than the book of Tehillim, which consists of every prayer, some psalms and hymns to God, others are prayers for forgiveness, and furthermore, King David comprised, comprised all the psalms with divine inspiration. Fortunate is the man who recites Tehillim, the Psalms, is what he says, at, with song and melody and concentration, unlike the rush and inattentive way it is recited in our generation. Rather, if one wishes to receive reward for reciting Psalms and to please God by the reaction, he must recite them attentively. Usually when the word... Uh, uh, I can't see it because the, the Hebrew letters are too small, appears in his pronounced edotecha, which is appears in Psalm 119. However, in the verse beginning with the letters of uh, of da the ma bin paretz is announced except the verse 120. So let me just go on. Um, so re reciting the Psalms is very important. I have a, 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 a song that I want to play for you that is done by Mattis Yahu. Are you guys familiar with him? Uh, with the artist Mattis Yahu? He is, uh, he, he, I, I, I don't think he's Orthodox anymore, but he used to be Orthodox and he's a rapper, okay? And I wanted to play a song that he recites. It's actually a Psalm and in that psalm is um, is a rabbi who wrote a tune that came from the temple itself. And so along with the psalm, you're going to hear the tune 
the 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 tune played and it's 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 uh it's it's very it's very powerful so what i'm going to do is let me share my screen with you uh and tell me when it's up okay can you see that okay yes yes okay here we go this melody can be sung uh, to the psalm number 30 that king david wrote which king solomon sang on the day of the dedication of the temple when Solomon had finished the temple and built it, and all the people were there for the dedication, waiting for the divine presence, the glory of God to be revealed, the prayers were not answered. And Solomon prayed again, and all the people prayed, but the prayers were not, not answered, and the glory of God was not revealed. And then Solomon sang this psalm with the orchestra by his father, King David. It's beautiful saying that please god with the merit of my father king david who wrote this song this song please let your glory shine forth from jerusalem to all of the world Okay, so that psalm is Psalm 30. This is a psalm, a song of dedication to the house by David. It says, I exalt you, God, for you. Sorry, excuse me one second. Um, I exalt you, for you have uplifted me and did not allow my enemies to rejoice over me. God, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. God, you have brought up my soul from the grave. You've kept me alive that I should not descend into the pit. Sing to God, you, his pious ones. Praise be his holy name. For his wrath endures but for a moment, and his favor, there is long life. When one retires at night weeping, joy will come in the morning. In my security, I thought, I shall never falter. God... By your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You have concealed your countenance. I am alarmed. I called to you, O God, and I made supplication to my God. And what profit is there in my death? In my going down to the grave, can dust praise you? Can it proclaim the, your truth? God, hear and be gracious to me. Be a help to me. You have turned my mourning into dancing for me. You have undone my sackcloth and girded me with joy. Therefore, my soul shall sing to you and not be silent. God is my God. I praise you forever. Is that not, is that not absolutely inspiring? To hear the words of Psalm, thinking this was read and sung on, at the temple on the day of the dedication. And when you, when you read these psalms, you realize this sounds a lot like our own personal prayers. It sounds like our prayers as we make an appeal to Hashem and we recount all of the things that we are thankful and blessed by. It's, it's an incredible lesson. That concludes this, uh, this portion of the recording on psalms. This has been the introduction to the book of psalms.